Okay, well, this morning we're going to be looking at what it is that causes these, these people we read about in the parable of uh, the sower, those that are on the stony ground, those who uh, have, were the soil represented by the thorns among the seeds. What is it that makes them look promising, you know, professing faith in Christ, but then eventually fall away? What is the, the method the devil uses in order to bring that about? And we do need to be aware of it. You know, we need to be aware of it for reasons I've already mentioned, uh, not the least of which he's still going to use it on us, even if he knows we, he can't destroy us. You know, the devil doesn't actually, I think, know um, our condition, absolutely. Uh, he can't read our minds. He can't know our hearts. Really, only the Lord knows, and sometimes we even deceive ourselves. So he's going to use these tactics on all of us to try to bring us down. Well, let me read the passage, first of all, 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 4. Paul writes to Timothy, who I believe was ministering in the city of Ephesus, uh, a city steeped with um, superstition, uh, Greek mythology. Uh, he says this, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing in His kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Now, I do think that what Paul is t talking to Timothy about here is something that, that happens to everybody who falls away. And that's why he is telling Timothy, why he's giving to him the solution, which we also want to consider this morning. But first, we do want to consider uh, the problem. Now, as I mentioned in our passage, Paul is urging Timothy to be faithful in his ministry because of the tendency, even of those who profess faith in Jesus Christ, to fall away. Now, he's reminding Timothy, and of course, the Spirit of God is reminding us this morning that not everyone, and this may sound strange, and I hope you understand it by this time, but not everyone who believes the gospel will necessarily be saved. Right? Because it's more than just believing facts. It's more than just historic faith. It's a change of heart. It's the new birth, right? Remember what Jesus tells us in the parable of the sower about the four ways that people respond to the gospel. He says that some reject it outright. Now, he does say they don't understand it. But what is it they don't understand? I mean, we might almost be led to the conclusion that what Jesus is saying is, here is that the, the, the gospel is unintelligible to them. They, they can't figure it out, that Jesus lived and died, He's a sacrifice for sins. If you trust Him, you'll be saved. That's not difficult to understand. I don't think that's really what Jesus is referring to. I think what He's saying is what they don't understand is how anybody could believe that or how that could be desirable to anyone. They don't see the beauty of these things because, as we know in Scripture, they are blind to it. So they're completely disinterested, and it has no effect on them. Well, Jesus says there are others who do receive it, but only for a while. Some of them receive it with joy. Okay? They believe it to be true, not just for others, but for themselves. They believe that Jesus has forgiven them. They believe that they've escaped hell and that they've gained heaven. And they're very happy. They're rejoicing. And so they follow Jesus, uh, but only for a while. Okay? When things get difficult, when the cost becomes too high, perhaps in a variety of ways, but specifically, Jesus says, because of persecution, they fall away. You know, they don't believe it that strongly. Not enough to give their lives, not enough to make themselves uncomfortable, not enough to go to jail, not enough to suffer the ridicule. They're not going to hold on to them. Okay. We're going to come back to see why they don't do that. Still others never seem to move forward in their obedience. They, they receive Jesus. It seems like they do. They believe the facts. They make profession. They enter into the church. But they just don't seem to grow. 
Okay, they become distracted, Jesus says. It's either because they're too worried about whether they're going to have what they need to make it through life. Say, if I follow Christ, it's maybe going to cost me my job. It's going to cost me all these various things. I'm not going to be able to pursue the things that I need to keep me secure, to make me feel certain I'm going to make it to the end of my life. It's the fear of poverty. And they drop off. It, it chokes the, the, you know, the seed so it doesn't produce fruit. Or maybe it's because they're pursuing the world too much. You know, they want the fame. They want the fortune more than they want Christ, more than they want the riches that the Father has to give us in the end, the reward. And so these never actually get down to serving Christ. They love the world too much or they're too, much, too worried about the things of the world. Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? Seek first the kingdom of heaven and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you, everything you need, everything the Gentiles are concerned about. And He also said this, you cannot serve mammon or you cannot serve wealth and God. You can't serve two masters. That's what Jesus is talking about in this parable. But again, thankfully, Jesus goes on to say there are others, still others, who by God's grace alone believe the gospel, receive the Lord Jesus Christ, they give up everything to follow Him, they trust in the Father's provision, and they give themselves to serve the Lord, and they're content with whatever the Lord provides along the way. Okay, well, what I want us to think about this morning is what Jesus is telling us in this parable in a specific, in, in a specific area. And what he's telling us is that there are these three groups of people who appear to receive the gospel, but most of those who do, most of those who profess faith in him, do not truly know him and in the end will fall away. And I think that's the basis upon which Paul is warning Timothy, okay? Jesus says also in the Sermon on the Mount this, Matthew seven fourteen: the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. I remember that Jonathan Edwards, again, you know I, how much I appreciate him, believed that in his day, the majority of the people who were in his church were not going to be saved. Now, we do know that that was perhaps mainly because everybody was in his church. You know, there weren't people not going to church on Sunday because that was the culture, that was the, the era but John Gerstner, who is a, a modern expositor of Jonathan Edwards, believed that also applies to the churches today. You've got these huge mega churches. He believed that even among them, the majority of them would not actually make it to heaven, okay? That they would fall away eventually because they never really loved the Lord. Those who love the Lord hold fast to the Lord. Those who love the Lord continue to follow Him. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, okay? If you really love me, He says, then not only now, but in the future, your life will be a pattern of obedience to me. How do we know somebody really loves Jesus? Well, it's because they obey Him even when things get difficult. Now, this morning, Paul reminds us that this falling away that, that Jesus is talking about here does not happen all at once. It's a process. It begins with a gradual withdrawing from the truth. Now, for our purposes this morning, for the purposes of this series, we, we need to remember that this is a process that isn't just going on by itself. There is a mastermind behind it, and that is the, the devil. And we need to realize that he uses this tactic on everyone who is professing faith in Christ and not just the unbeliever who's going to fall away. He knows, again, that he can use this on us, and, and oftentimes he is successful to weaken us and to get us to fall into sin. So what I want us to consider this morning is this particular strategy of the enemy. Now, this, again, is another Brooks strategy, but as I looked at what uh, Brooks was talking about, I took just the main point and found in this text more of something I think we can, we can maybe wrap our minds around. So I'm not really going to be quoting Brooks this morning. I did, though, take this idea. Satan will try to get us to look at the truth in a 
way that is not favorable. You know, we'll, we'll, he's going to try to get us to turn against the truth. Okay. Well, okay, how does this work? Well, Paul understood what Jesus was talking about in the parable of the sower. I mean, did Paul know what Jesus said? I'm not sure about that exactly. He, he may very well have at some point uh, had access to the Gospels. I'm sure Jesus revealed quite a bit to him. And, of course, he had the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But he certainly knew this principle, okay? He knew that not everyone that he or Timothy ministered to was necessarily a true believer. Now, why? Well, we need to remember that there was something special going on in that day. It was called revival, right? Revival. And during that revival on the day of Pentecost, there were thousands that were swept into the kingdom of heaven all at once, or at least who began to profess faith in Christ and, and were baptized. And then shortly after that, when Peter preaches at the healing of the lame man, thousands more come into the kingdom of heaven. And as Paul goes throughout the, uh, the Roman Empire preaching in various places, breaking new ground, well, thousands more profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But do we understand by that that all these people that were affected in this way, that they were all saved? No, I don't think we can. I think we have to understand from what Jesus said that all of these who professed fell into these three categories, which means that Paul understood that some would only continue for a while. That's why he writes in verse 3 of our text, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Who are they? Well, those who are going to fall away. Now, let me just try to explain a little bit of what's going on here, and perhaps as we do, that um, we may actually deal with a couple of other issues quickly. But what is this time that Paul is referring to here? Well, that isn't entirely clear. When is this going to happen? Now, he could be pointing back to what he wrote in chapter 3, verse 1 of this same book or this letter where he says, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Maybe he's referring to those times. Well, when are those times? You know, many evangelicals today see this as the time in which we are now living. They believe that Paul was referring to the future and warning Timothy about this future time that Timothy would never live to see and something that we're still wondering when, when it's going to happen, okay? Well, maybe Paul was mistaken and maybe he was telling Timothy, you need to be ready for it because everybody seemed to think it was going to happen right away. Well, you see, the thing that they were being warned about and that they were warning about was not Christ's second coming, which was many... Um, what, centuries away from Paul's time, but what he was warning about was the thing that was close to his day, that time that was coming when God's judgment was going to fall on Israel for their rejection of the Messiah. We do need to remember that that was the day in which Paul and Timothy were living. Remember what John writes in his first letter? That they were living not only in the last days, but they were actually living in the last hour. He says in 1 John 2.18, Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know it is the last hour. So God's judgment on the Jews for crucifying His Son, their Messiah in 70 A.D., that time was near. John said, it's very, very close. And how did John know that? Well, notice it was because of these antichrists that had arisen. And what, what was the significance of that? Well, remember that Jesus in the Olivet Discourse where he's talking about God's judgment on Jerusalem in 70 AD warns that one of the signs that would precede it was the, you know, the, the arrival of these antichrists, those who were claiming to be him, who were doing these lying signs and false wonders. John saw them, and he knew the time was near. He knew the destruction of the temple was near. So Paul may have had that in mind. And what he had in mind was not, again, these days, but those days prior to 70 AD. And how do we know that? Well, we need to remember that he wrote this particular letter, 2 Timothy, was the last letter he wrote. 
He wrote it at the end of his fourth missionary journey, which is the one that he takes to, to Spain, which we don't read about, chronicled in, in Luke's uh, Acts, but um, it would have been then around 64 to 68 A.D., so that time was near. So he could have been referring to that time these people would fall away, or he could simply have meant that Timothy would eventually see some fall away because his hearers were a mixed multitude. Timothy, these people are following you now. They're following Christ now. They're listening to you now, but realize that they're going to fall away. Now, for our purposes, it doesn't really matter whether he was referring to the time of 70 AD. That's when things were going to get more intense because what he's talking about here is something that happens all the time. It's a tactic the devil uses all the time. It may be intensified at that particular time, but it's still the same process. The time will come, Paul writes, when they will not endure sound doctrine. Okay? And what he means by that is some of Timothy's hearers would no longer be willing to listen patiently to correct teaching. Okay? Sometimes the words that are used to translate this make it sound a little bit more esoteric. When they will not endure sound doctrine, they're not going to be willing to sit and listen to correct teaching. Now, we know they don't start out this way. We already saw in the parable of the sower, <clears throat> they can be excited, they can be hungry, they can be devouring what they're hearing, they can read their Bibles, maybe not in those days, but in our day. Read the Bible, they can read good Christian books. I mean, I remember a gal in this church a few years ago. You know, I don't think any of you have ever met her. I can, won't mention her name, but I'll use her as an example, right? But she seemingly turned to the Lord. She had this hunger. She was excited. She thought the Lord had forgiven her. She was reading the Bible. She was reading, she read Pilgrim's Progress and I think parts one and two within a couple of days. And then she read J.C. Ryle's Holiness and she loved it. And she loved coming to listen to the Word of God, to, to the preaching, whereas before she hated it. Things looked so positive for her, right? But then she turned away and went back into drugs, got hooked again on heroin, left the church. You couldn't talk to her because she would never do what she said she was going to do. So like the, um, well, like these hearers that Jesus warned us about in the parable, they start out well, okay, but eventually they begin to turn away. They eventually do not want to listen to the truth any longer because it no longer appeals to them. Now, the question is, why does that happen? Why does that happen to some people? Well, Jesus explained it in the parable of the sower in these particular ways, because of difficulties, because of worries, because of the desire for the things of the world. Now, I think we need to explain what happens to them in terms of common grace. Uh, you've maybe heard me talk about this before as well. What the Puritans refer to as awakening. Okay, that's a very real concept, something that really happens. That's why the Great Awakening was called the Awakening and not the Great Conversion is because there was a Great Awakening. And yeah, there were more people who were converted, but not everybody who was awakened was converted. Most of the people who were awakened eventually fell away. So what we're talking about here, what Jesus is talking about here, what Paul is warning against here are those people who are awakened but are not genuinely converted, okay? So that's the Spirit of God working on the conscience to make us feel the weight of, the, of those warnings about breaking God's law. Uh, the Spirit of God shows us the reality of hell and that we're on our way there. We become concerned. We get, uh, you know, we're, we're awakened to our danger. And we begin to run towards Christ, but Again, not truly, not because we love Him, but because we're looking for somebody to save us out of the danger that we now believe ourselves to be in. And so we come to Him, or they, they come to Him, at least they think they do. They profess Him. They, they follow Him for a time. They even rejoice because they believe themselves to be safe. But you see, this awakening most often wears off. Okay? It doesn't continue. Now, it doesn't wear off for everyone. We know that 
some who are awakened actually do come to saving faith in Christ. They come all the way. But for many people, it does wear off. And as it does, they no longer sense their danger. Their commitment begins to weaken. And the truth no longer seems to have any appeal to them. Okay? So that's the first thing that happens. They, they no longer want to listen to it. Sit patiently and listen to things that are right. Things that are good. What God's Word actually says. So then they begin looking for others who will say what it is they actually want to hear. Paul says in verse 3, wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. Now, Godfrey told us in one of his previous lectures that it's, it's not difficult to convince someone of something they want to believe. And so these begin looking, and you know, they, they look for others who will tell them what they want to hear because it has the effect of strengthening their position, doesn't it? Finding those who agree with them will make them feel justified in this new belief system that they have. You know, oh, I don't have to go to church. I, I, I don't have to obey the commandments. I, I can just pray the prayer, and I'm going to make it to heaven. They want to hear that because it makes Christianity easy. It means you don't have to deny yourself. You don't have to pick up your cross. You don't have to cross your flesh. You don't have to repent of your sins. You can have Christ and heaven too. So again, this makes them feel more justified. I mean, think about a secular example of this. Think about how strongly the LBGTQ, and I don't know how many letters come after that, but just think about how strongly that movement promotes its view and tries to get more and more people to agree with them and to practice the same sin. Why are they trying to do that? Well, it's so perhaps on, on the one hand, they'll have more people from which to choose their, you know, their relations on the one hand, but it's also so that they won't feel as guilty about practicing it because the more people they can get to agree with them, the more secure they're going to feel about it. There's a logical fallacy that, and by the way, if you're, gonna, if you're ever going to study logic, that's the one area you should really study. Uh, R.C. Sproul has, a, I think, a tape on it somewhere. What are called informal fallacies, and it's talk, it talks about those, those um, arguments that are used that are, that are really false arguments, and this is one of them. It's called the argumentum ad populum, which is really the fallacy of popularity, right? Um, it must be true if so many people believe it, right? Every, all of these can't be wrong. And so the thing is, when you get a large group of people who agree with you, it, it solidifies your position. It makes you feel right, okay? But there's a fallacy with that. All of these people can be wrong. The fact that, that a lot of people embrace it actually means nothing, right? Truth is not determined by a vote, although it may be in our society. It's not in God's eyes. It's determined by the standard. And what God believes is the truth is really the only thing that matters because we're going to see everyone is going to have to stand before him in that last day. So then he says, finally, when they're secure in their new position... 2 Timothy 4, verse 4, they turn away their ears from the truth and turn aside to myths, to something that isn't true. Now, in those days, this myth may have been referring simply to an untrue story, a false tale, some of the fables that, that cropped up among the Jews, Jewish myths, or he could have been referring to the, you know, to the false religion that was being practiced in Ephesus, the worship of, of Artemis, right, because that's where Timothy was ministering. But as they begin to follow this new path, one of the many that Satan has to offer, they try to find a camp that is, you know, again, presenting that. They, they turn aside to these things. They give themselves over to it. Now, actually, you know, we've already seen several examples of this in our evening series. Remember a couple weeks ago, we saw the rise of Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian Science, Shakerism. Tonight, we're going to see several more, uh, again, attempts to um, undermine God's Word, to give us alternate explanations that will 
leave us off the hook for doing what God requires, for what God commands. That's what these people are looking for. And tonight, we're going to see higher criticism. It's going to attack the Bible. Uh, the evolutionary hypothesis, you weren't created by God. You're just, you know, an accident that, that occurred over long periods of time. The communism of Karl Marx, which I don't think he has an explanation for how the world began, except perhaps buying into evolution. But um, showing us what it is that drives uh, human history forward, and that's the greed, you know, greed for money. Or the psychology of Sigmund Freud, who tries to leave us off the hook for our sins by saying, you didn't do it, it was your subconscious. Okay. Now, all of these arise from science. They all undermine biblical truth. But who's behind all of these things? These are simply lies of the enemy, alternate worldviews that he presents to you to say you can just adopt this and feel fine about how you're living. Okay. Well, this is how the devil brings the false professor down. This is why these, you know, where they eventually go and how they get there, these that originally embraced God's Word. But again, for our purposes, we need to remember He also uses this tactic on us to weaken us, to sideline us, to make us ineffective in, in the kingdom. Now, the first thing the devil is going to do is he is going to tempt us with a particular sin, which we've already seen. By the way, Satan is not going to tempt you in the areas where you're strong. He's going to tempt you in the areas where you're weakest. He knows our weaknesses, and he will attack us where we are weak. And let's not forget that the Lord is the one who allows him to do that. He can't do it without God's permission. And that's why Jesus teaches us in the Sermon on the Mount to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. But why does the Lord allow him to attack our weak areas? Why does he do that to us? It's because He wants to strengthen us, and that strength doesn't come by just simply zapping us with power, but by making us deal with the issue, right? We're going to get attacked. We need to know how to defend ourselves against Him. So anyway, He will attack us, and again, He'll, he'll attack us where we're weak in a particular area. He'll try to get us to sin. Once He gains our consent, okay, once He gains our consent, once our heart is inclining towards that, then He's going to make us begin to look at what God says about it as something that is inconvenient, something that's just getting in our way. If it's something that we are tempted to love more than God, and we know we shouldn't, well then, it's the first commandment that's getting in our way, and we're going to sour on that. If we've made promises that we know we're breaking, you know, that we don't want to keep because, again, it's inconvenient for us, well, then we're going to sour on the third commandment. We're going to begin to depreciate it. You know, you, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. When we make a promise, we need to keep it. Or if we're struggling with worship, we really don't want to go to worship the fourth commandment, okay? If, if we're struggling with sexual sin, we're going to set aside the seventh commandment. And I think, I think we get the idea. First, we're going to rash, try to rationalize the sin, that it's not wrong, and um, we're going to try to change the commandment, the standard, to make it fit the way that I want to live. Remember what uh, one of my seminary professors said at one time, that if you're living contrary to what the Word of God says, and there's a tension between those two things, most often what happens is we change the, we change the standard, okay, to make it fit our lifestyle instead of the other way around, change the way we're living to fit the standard. So we're going to try to rationalize our sin, change the standard that what we're doing really isn't wrong or maybe it's not that bad or maybe we have some reason or some excuse for not keeping it. Then we're going to look for others who agree with us, okay? And we can always find people who do agree. When you're looking for a reason to reject a particular truth, you can search the web you're going to find people who reject it, and that's going to strengthen your position. And then finally, you're going to choose to go another direction, completely contrary to the Word of God. Now, we do know that if we're true believers, we're not going to turn away from that truth forever. The Lord will bring us back. But we need to remember whenever we're tempted to get off that path, that it is going to cost us. In the end, when we get back on the path, we're going to look back and we're going to say, I wish I had never turned in that particular direction.
Okay, so the question is, how can we resist this temptation? So let me give us a few things to think about. Well, first of all, remember that the enemy is going to try to undermine the Bible entirely. He's going to try to just tell you it is not the Word of God. That's what we're going to see something about this evening. We need to be fully convinced that it is, okay? That it is God's truth, that these are His very words. And again, here's where apologetics can be very helpful. I'm not going to try to rehearse them for you this morning. But these arguments can bring us back to reality, bring us face to face with the fact that this is God's truth. Now, secondly, knowing that it's His Word, we do need to remember that God intends everything He says for our good. He loves us. And we need to be convinced that He has told us these things out of His love and be convinced that if we step off of this path, we are going to get hurt or we're going to hurt other people. Okay, we, we already just saw how that works. If we take a step in the wrong direction and we don't let God's Word correct us, we're going to go further and further away from Him. You know, I've, I've discovered just, I've, I've, I've been pastoring for many years. You know, you can tell by my, by my age, you know. Uh, but I've seen it happen over and over again. What's the first thing that happens? People stop coming to church. They begin to fall away. And then eventually, if they never come back, you'll hear that they've gotten involved in, in things that are they're just so far away. But it begins by their departure from the Word. And again, we're going to see that in just a moment. And really, isn't that the main point of Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, wasn't it? There's a path that leads to heaven. That path is straight and it's narrow, and you need to stay on it. It's not always easy to walk on it. But every time you get off, what happens? You get into trouble, big trouble. And when you get back on the path, what does Christian always discover? Boy, I wish I had listened to God in the first place and never gotten off the path because of what it cost me. We need to stay on the path. It is the safe path, right? We also need to remember what Paul says in verse 1 is true. And here we get back to our text again. He says in verse 1 to Timothy, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing in His kingdom. Why do we need to take what God says so seriously? It's because there's a day of judgment. And on that day of judgment, we need to make sure that we are not just bare professors who are saying, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but every time His Word crosses our will, we choose our will rather than God's Word. True believers choose the will of God. We need to make sure that we are doing the will of God, that we are truly trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if we are we will have that evidence of our justification, sanctification, obedience, love, growing into His likeness. Okay, we need to um, also remember that every time we step off the path, we, we lose a good deal of time that we could have been using serving the Lord. And as we serve the Lord, God's going to reward us. And these rewards we can only gain in this world while we're here with the short period of time that we have. We can't gain them in heaven. We can only gain them here. And that's one of the reasons, again, why the devil doesn't want us to walk on that path, because he knows if we do, what we do will thwart his kingdom. But if we stay on that path, we will gain more rewards in heaven. So we do need to stay on the path and not step off of it, because it is for our good in so many ways. But now the question is, how can we stay on the path? How can we do that? Well, the simple answer is we have to want to, okay? And what makes us want to stay on the path? Well, it's love, isn't it? We have to love God more than ourselves. We have to find our true joy and delight in Him and not in the things of the world. We have to love Him enough to want to obey Him. Again, Jesus says in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So how can we love Him more? Well, we can only do it through the means of grace, and Paul points to one specifically, God's Word. That's why he exhorts Timothy and gives to him the solution to the problem. He says in verses 1 and 2, 
actually verse 2, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. The devil is working hard to keep us out of God's word because he knows if we, if we know it and we hold fast to it, we will be safe from him. He knows that if he can keep us away from it, he will weaken us, even if we're true believers, and he can destroy us if we are only false professors. We have to stay in the word. But I want to draw your attention to the mode of the word ministered, okay? Paul is saying to Timothy, preach the word, okay? For Timothy, this is how you are going to make sure your people are safe, okay? This is what builds us up. This is what ensures that we make it to heaven. He says in, in 1 Timothy 4, verse 16, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. Now, I think what Paul is telling Timothy here is he's saying that what needs to take place here is public worship. People need to be in it, and you need to be doing something here because preaching is something, this kind of authoritative preaching and teaching is something that only takes place in the context of public worship. It's primarily through preaching that God reproves us, which means He convinces us we're in error. I hope we've all seen something of that in our own lives this morning. I mean, where, where, does, the, you know, where does the insight to apply this come from? But the fact that I've experienced this myself, okay? Timothy knows he's experienced it. Paul's saying, look at your own experience. You need to be in the Word. And as you're in the Word, preaching and teaching, you will ensure salvation not only for yourself, but for those people who hear, because we need the Word to reprove us of our errors, where we've gone astray, where we've gotten off the path. We need to be rebuked, which means we need to be convinced and commanded to turn back onto the path. And we need to be exhorted, which, you know, exhortation really just means encouraged to stay on the path. And sometimes what we get is primarily exhortation, encouragement. So God loves you. Christ loves you. And we need to hear that. Okay? We need to know that great love that he has. But if we hear about love constantly, by the way, when I was, um, uh, before I became a minister and, and was ministering from Lord's Day to Lord's Day, when I was in a Calvary chapel, I, I think I told you, I sat under, under two pastors, one who every Sunday would give us a swift kick in the behind and would say, you need to get out there and you need to be doing this work for the Lord, okay? And, and under that ministry, we did. <laughs> and then under another minister who came in after him when he went into full-time evangelism, this other minister kept telling us about how much the Lord loves us. And when he brought judgment, he kills all these Assyrians. Isn't God a gracious God? Isn't God a loving God? Everything was just interpreted love, 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 and that's all you heard. And you could just feel yourself slumping down in the chair and thinking, oh, God loves me so much, I, I really don't need to do anything. But, but the point is, He does love us, but we need to love Him too. You know, that love is, is meant to reciprocate, and our love for the Lord is expressed in our walking on His path and obeying Him, and all of that has to take place. We need to learn about that, be reminded of that in the context of public worship, which is why He commands preaching. I think it's kind of funny. I'm sorry that I'm going so long in one sense and another sense I'm not. When I first came here years ago, there was a group of people here who, if I went longer than 20 minutes, would get really angry. You know, they'd get angry at me and they'd want to throw me out because I was going too long. You know, went past the appointed hour. I could only listen for 20 minutes and that's it. And, but that's the wrong attitude, isn't it? The, the Lord wants us to be steeped in His Word. He wants us to learn. He wants us to be encouraged. He wants us to be rebuked. So the Lord is telling us through Paul that we do need to be faithful in these things. We need to be faithful in coming to public worship. We need to hear the word preached. We need prayer. We need the sacraments. We need fellowship. We need all of these things if we are to be strong. So the point is, rather than listening to the devil 
as he tempts us to change our beliefs in order to make them agree with the way that we're choosing to live, we need to make sure we let the Word of God tell us how we are to live, okay, through the preaching of the Word so that we will walk in His ways and we will be safe from the enemy. By the way, this is also what builds us up in love, isn't it? That love is what's going to make us want to stay on the path. We need to be in the Word. And He's going to do everything He can to try to keep us out of it, okay? Whenever you feel that temptation, you need to know that's the enemy working. That's not God who is telling you. The Spirit of God will get us into the Word, keep us in the Word, bringing us to worship. He will, again, get us into all the means of grace for our good. That is how the Lord will keep us on the path and bring us to heaven. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer. Let's ask the Lord to help us to take this to heart, to apply it.